Hello, welcome to lesson four of the Practical OSPF series. In this lesson, we're going to take a closer look at the neighbor adjacency process. We're going to step through the sequence of states two routers will go through in order to become full neighbors. Back in lesson one, we talked through the different packets that OSPF uses in all its conversations. Then, back in lesson three, we showed you everything inside a hello packet. And specifically, we outline which parts of a hello packet must match for two routers to become OSPF neighbors. If any of that is unfamiliar to you, I'd highly recommend starting with those two lessons. For this lesson, I want to draw your attention to these two fields of the OSPF hello packet. For our routers, router 1 and router 2 are going to have a router ID of 1.1.1.1 and 2.2.2.2, respectively. In the neighbors field, you'll see populated as we step through the sequence of events and packets that are being sent between router 1 and router 2. Make sure you understand the implication of the neighbors field. We talked about it in the last lesson when we unpacked hello packets. With that said, we are now going to step through the neighbor adjacency process between router 1 and router 2. And here you see all eight states that the neighbors will go through. The starting point is the down state and the ending point is the full state and we are about to step through every state in between. So let's start with the initial state, which is the down state. The down state is the initial state when OSPF is first configured. So if we jumped on router one and enabled OSPF on this interface, you would see router one go into the down state. In the down state, the routers are going to try and discover other OSPF routers by sending these periodic hellos to the multicast address for all OSPF routers. Now, technically, the down state is a non-state. What I mean by that is that, as we discussed back in lesson one, every OSPF router is going to maintain a neighbor table. And inside that neighbor table is going to be the router ID of a particular neighbor and the state of that neighbor relationship. At the moment, the neighbor relationship for router one's adjacency with router two is in the down state. But notice at this point, the only thing that's happened is router one has sent a low packet. We haven't received anything from router 2, which means router 1 doesn't actually know router 2's router ID, which means router 1 doesn't have an entry to put in the neighbor table. So in reality, at this point, router 1's neighbor table would be empty. That's what I mean when I say the down state is technically a non-state. There isn't going to be an entry in router 1's neighbor table at this point. Now since we haven't received anything from router 2, Inside this hello packet, the active neighbors field is going to be empty. Remember, the purpose of this field is for router1 to list the other neighbors that router1 sees on this link. And again, at this point, nothing has been sent by router2, so router1 does not see any neighbors on this link. You'll see this change as we continue the sequence. So that's the down state. Now, sometimes you'll come across the attempt state. The attempt state is actually pretty rare, you're only going to see that on non-broadcast multi-access links. Recall that I mentioned there are certain types of links that don't support multicast packets. And on those links, you have to manually configure the neighbor's IP address. Meaning I have to tell router one that the IP address of router two is 10.1.2.2. In those cases, the hello packets are being sent unicast to the IP address that you manually configured. And in those cases, you will see an entry in the neighbor table using the IP address that you manually configured. And the state of this entry is going to be attempt. That's the only time that you would see the attempt state. Now for us, we're gonna keep it simple and we're gonna consider that this link does support multicast packets and therefore we are not going to come across the attempt state. But I did wanna provide a definition for what that state means. For us, we're gonna continue with this adjacency. Now, to be clear, it isn't that router one is down. It's that the relationship with another router is currently down. This is a reference to the state of an adjacency and not the router itself. In any case, in this down state, router one is going to be periodically sending out these hello packets, trying to discover another router on this link. At some point in time, router two is also going to be configured for OSPF. But until that time, router one is simply going to continue sending out these hello packets. Now let's just say that at this point in time, router2 is configured with OSPF, and this interface is enabled within OSPF. That'll trigger router2 going into the down state, because again, that is the initial state when OSPF is first configured. And then, just like router1, router2 is going to start sending out these hello packets. 
Now notice that router 2's neighbor field is also empty. That's because OSPF was configured right about here, after this hello packet had already been sent. So that means technically, router 2 hasn't received a hello packet after OSPF was configured. But from router 1's perspective, OSPF is already configured when this hello was sent and received, which means router 1 has just received a hello packet from a potential neighbor. That triggers router 1 to transfer into init state, or the initialization state. The init state happens anytime a hello packet is received. And then, having received a hello packet from router 2, all of router 1's outgoing hello packets are now going to include their peer's router ID, which means router 1's hello packets now include that it's seen something from 2.2.2.2. This is going to trigger router 2 going into the two-way state. The two-way state also happens after a hello is received, but specifically it happens when a hello is received and the router sees its own router ID inside that hello packet. In fact, the very definition of the two-way state is that there is positive confirmation of two-way reachability. Router 2 sent a hello packet, and Router 2 knows that hello packet was received because Router 2 sees its own router ID inside the response hello packet from Router 1. Router 1 only would have known Router 2's router ID if it had received this hello packet. In any case, now that Router 2 has received a hello packet from router 1, router 2's outgoing hello packets will now include router 1's router ID in the hello packet, and upon receiving this hello packet, this gives router 1 positive confirmation of two-way reachability on this link, and router 1 can now go into the two-way state. Notice router 1 went from the down state to the init state and then to the two-way state, whereas router 2 went from the down state directly to the two-way state. That happens all the time and is simply a result of who sends the hello first when OSPF is being configured on this link. So at this point, both routers are in the two-way state, which means both routers have seen each other in each other's hello packets. They are now going to use the content of the hello packet to determine if the adjacency is going to proceed. Remember in the last lesson, I told you that there are six items that exist within the hello packets which must match for two routers to decide to continue with an adjacency. That's what they're going to be comparing at this point. And there's also another element that goes into whether the adjacency will proceed. We're going to unpack that when we explore the DR and BDR election process further later on in the series. For now, I just want to note is this is where they're going to make a decision to proceed or not. Now, in our case, we're going to say they do decide to proceed. And following the two-way state, both routers will go into the X start state, which stands for exchange start. In the X start state, the routers are going to exchange DBD packets, or database descriptors. And the purpose of these DBD packets is to do the master and slave election. Now, there's a lot of misconceptions about the master and slave elections, and I want to make sure we clearly identify what this does. The purpose of the master-slave election is simply to govern the reliable exchange of further DBDs. You'll see what I mean shortly. But the mechanism that OSPF uses to determine reliable DBD exchanges is that one router is elected as the master, and every DBD exchange conversation always goes master says something, slave responds. Master says something, slave responds. Master says something, slave responds. It's a one by one packet send, packet receive process. And again, you'll see what I mean shortly. In any case, the way the master slave election works is initially both routers think they are the master router. So they send these DVDs indicating that they are the master. Then the router with the higher router ID is elected as the actual master. In our example, router 2 has a higher numerical router ID, which means router 1 is the slave and router 2 is the master. What happens next is the slave is going to drop into exchange state and then send a confirmation DVD indicating it does acknowledge it is the slave in this relationship. Once that confirmation DVD is received, the master will then drop into exchange state as well. So in the X start state, the master and slave election occurs, and in the exchange state, the master and slave election is complete. Next, we go to the actual purpose of the DVD packets, which is to exchange LSDB summaries. Now there is a misconception with the master and slave process that the master always goes first. That isn't actually the case. 
This DVD packet is both a confirmation that the slave is the slave and also includes the LSTB summary of the slave. Then the master sends a DVD with the LSDB summary of the master, and the slave acknowledges receiving that by sending an empty DVD packet. Now remember what I told you about the reliable exchange of DVDs? If we ignore the original DVD sent by the slave before it recognized that it was a slave, you'll see something sent from the master and something sent from the slave, something sent from the master and something sent from the slave. If at this point the slave needed to send something else, it would indicate so by setting a particular bit in this DVD. This would prompt the master to send an empty DVD simply to provide an opportunity for the slave to respond. And if the master needs to send something after this DVD, it'll simply send it once it receives the confirmation of the slave. And of course, the slave will finally acknowledge the final DVD sent by the master. In all cases, the conversation between the master and the slave is always going to go master speaks, slave responds. Master speaks, slave responds. And you can see that here. At this point, both peers have exchanged their LSDB summary, which means both peers are now in the loading state. In the loading state, both peers know the LSAs that exist in their neighbor's LSDB, and they can pick from that list the ones that they actually need. And they'll request the full LSA by going through the LSR, LSU, LSAC process. The way that works is one of the routers will send a link state request. That'll prompt the other router to send an LSU or a link state update, which will then prompt the initial router to send an LSAC or a link state acknowledgement. Inside the LSR is a request for specific LSAs that router one needs from router two's LSDB. And inside the LSU, router two is actually providing those LSAs. And finally, the LSAC is simply acknowledging the received LSAs. Once router one has sent this LSAC, indicating it's received these three LSAs, it then goes into the full state. At this point, router one has learned everything it needs to learn from router two. And now we need router two to do the same from router one. And router two is gonna go through the exact same process. It's going to send a link state request asking for specific LSAs. That'll prompt router one to send an LSU providing the specific LSAs. And finally, an LSAC will be sent from router two, confirming reception of those LSAs. And now router two is also in the full state. In the full state, the LSDBs are finally synchronized. And this actually completes the full OSPF neighbor adjacency. The full state is what I'm gonna call the happy state. It's the state that we want all OSPF neighbor adjacencies to reach. And in order to reach the full state, the routers are gonna step through these eight adjacency states. So that takes care of talking through the full OSPF neighbor state machine. You should be able to see all the eight states on your screen right now and have a good idea about what happens at each state and why. In the next lesson, we're actually gonna step away from the slides a little bit and configure and play with OSPF together. We're gonna to prove to you all the things that we discussed in the previous four lessons. Remember, the goal of this series was to make you a competent OSPF engineer. To do that, I wanna do more than just tell you how OSPF works. I wanna actually show it to you. So that's it for this lesson. The main takeaways are on your screen right now. If you learned something from this video, then please help me out with the YouTube algorithm. You can do so by leaving a comment, liking, and subscribing. That would really help me out and I would appreciate it greatly. Also, feel free to join us on Discord by browsing to pracnet.net slash Discord. And if you're studying for the CCNA and want more free resources from practical networking, check out pracnet.net slash CCNA. Otherwise, that wraps up this video. I want to thank you for watching this lesson. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you in the next one.